good evening to everyone and welcome to today's session <clears throat> today we'll have a, a very brief session about an hour so instead of totally bunking the class the teacher thought uh, um we shall definitely have a session so it had been a continuous uh, classes including sunday so sometimes any human being gets fatigued so that was a uh, there was not much of time to compensate the slides so but still today we will discuss two topics papilledema and uh, the cranial nerve palsy of extraocular muscles we'll have a short quiz discussion and uh, we'll call it off so we welcome our online students dr rohit raipur deepika sarvodaya manu varun rai and uh, the students of tirupati karnool vaizag and everyone so cranial nerve palsy is one of the favorite issues for the examiner if you look at the extraocular muscles how is their origin and insertion annulus of gin you heard of that right all the rectus muscles they originate from a common tendinous ring which is called the annulus of gin which is attached to the apex of the orbit where is it located typically you are having a optic foramen through which the optic nerve is passing around that you have this annulus of zin from which all this uh, recti will be basically originating then all these four recti typically will be running forward on the eyeball and they will be inserting onto the sclera at different distances from the limbus then how about obliques we need to remember superior oblique for what reason doctor superior oblique typically will be arising from the uh, bone above and medial to the optic foramen and uh, there is a pulley which is associated with the otherwise called trochlea associated with uh, the superior oblique so the superior oblique as what you can see here typically through the pulley will be inserting onto the upper and outer part of the sclera then how is the inferior oblique doctor typically inferior oblique is inserted into the lower and outer part of the sclera behind the equator now you all know what is the nerve supply all muscles are by oculomotor except the superior oblique which is the fourth cranial nerve which is also called trochlear nerve and the lateral rectus which abducts over eye is basically by abducens which is the sixth cranial nerve now what is the role of all these uh, extra ocular muscles typically they will rotate the eyeball in a vertical horizontal and the antero posterior axis if you look at the recti the medial and lateral recti typically they are almost parallel to the optical axis so that is the reason they have only one action either to adduct or abduct the eye they don't have any secondary action there is the superior and inferior rectus typically they make an angle of about 23 degrees and they have uh, and similarly if you look at uh, superior and inferior oblique their tendons make an angle of about 51 degrees to the optical axis so that is the reason they have one main axis action and subsidiary actions that's what we need to remember so now summarize doctor this is the most important table which we cannot afford to miss adduction abduction are medial and lateral rectus elevation is superior rectus depression is inferior rectus easy to remember superior oblique typically lead to intorsion 
So second reaction of superior rectus is also in torsion. That's the reason superior syntort, whether recti or oblique, but for oblique it is the primary action. Inferior extort, for inferior oblique it is the primary action, whereas for the inferior rectus extortion is the secondary action. Then superior oblique will also cause depression, so it is superior it will depress. And inferior oblique will elevate, so these are the things that need to be remembered. Now, what are the various types of the ocular movements that you know, doctor? We have uni uniocular movements which are called ductions. We have an adduction, abduction, supraduction, introduction. Adduction, medial movement, abduction, lateral movement, and supraduction is upward movement which is also called elevation, and introduction which is a depression. Then, what else do we have? We have intorsion and extorsion. What exactly intorsion means to say? You have a anteroposterior axis, no, for the globe of the eyeball. Now the superior pole of the cornea typically moves medially. Then you call intorsion. And if the rotatory movement of the AP axis in which the superior pole moves laterally, you call it as extortion. Now what are the various binocular movements where both the eyes are involved? We have two types. One is called versions, other are called vergences. So what is a version? The other name given for a conjugate movement of the eye is called as version. That means synchronously the two eyes will be moving. So, the synchronous, simultaneous, symmetric movement of both the eyes is basically called as version. So, what do you mean by dextroversion? Both eyes are looking towards right. You call dextroversion. And what is the reason for it? It is the right lateral rectus and my left to medial rectus. Together will be working. Then, levoversion means left side conjugate eye movement. So, this is the typical dextroversion. But as we discussed yesterday, whenever you are having a dextroversion with your right eye looking towards your right side and your left eye adducting, who will be that connecting link which will say that the right eye is abducting? Who will tell to the left eye to adduct? So, for the right eye's abduction, what, which nucleus is involved? Abducens nucleus, which is located in pons. Third, fourth, midbrain. Fifth, sixth, seventh, pons. So, sixth is in pons. Then, in the pons, when the sixth cranial nucleus is stimulated and the right eye is undergoing abduction, Yeah, is it audible now? <coughs> Just check whether it is audible or not. <coughs> All right. So, whenever we are having a dextroversion, the right side abducens nucleus is first stimulated in the pons. For the medial longitudinal fasciculus, same time the left side oculomotor nerve is the one which is being informed 
and uh, it is expected to adduct the left eye so that we can see towards our right side. Suppose if the medial longitudinal fasciculus is damaged, what will happen? When I am looking towards my right, my right eye will adduct, uh, will abduct, but my left eye is not adducting same time because medial longitudinal fasciculus has some demyelination, whatever be the reason. Then what is that called as? The left eye's adductor lag. So my left eye is looking straight only. My right eye is looking towards my right side. Then I will develop diplopia. To overcome the diplopia, what will my abducting eye will immediately will be doing? It will quickly go into nystagmus and try to come back to the primary position. So the abducting eye will have nystagmus. There is a adductor lag if the medial longitudinal fasciculus get affected, which is basically called internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Between which nucleus and other nucleus? It is between the sixth cranial nerve nucleus in the pons and the third cranial nerve nucleus in the midbrain. Now you may ask me a question. Sir, suppose if your left side oculomotor palsy, if it is there, oculomotor palsy, if it is there, then also if you are looking towards your right side, your left eye cannot adduct, no? You got my point. Suppose if I am having an oculomotor palsy in my left eye, doctor, if I am looking towards my right side, my right eye will abduct. Due to the oculomotor palsy, my left eye cannot adduct. Then how do we differentiate whether the adductor lag is because of oculomotor palsy or because of between sixth cranial nerve nucleus and uh, third cranial nucleus, what is that path called? MLF. Is it the medial longitudinal fasciculus problem or it is only my oculomotor palsy problem which is leading to this adductor lag? How will you differentiate? Ask the patient to look close to a near point. Normally, whenever we look at near point, what will happen? Both of our eyes will adduct. What is that called? Convergence. For that, do you need medial longitudinal fasciculus? You don't need. So, that is the reason, even if I have internuclear ophthalmoplegia also, if I am asked to look towards a near point, my both eyes will converge and my left eye will adduct. But if it is due to medial longitudinal fasciculus, if it is due to oculomotor palsy, then for my conjugate gaze also there is adductor lag. When I look nearer to an object also, my eye does not adduct in both the situations. So that is how we basically differentiate. So how is the convergence in the case of the medial longitudinal fasciculus? Injury doctor, convergence is normal or abnormal? Convergence reaction at the time of convergence, will there be adductor lag? No. Only in a conjugate lateral eye movement only there will be adductor lag. If the medial longitudinal fasciculus is having a problem. Agreed? So convergence is preserved. If it is medial longitudinal fasciculus, that means there will be adduction of both the eyes which will occur if a near print is being read. Are we clear? That is good. <clears throat> now, doctor, Varun is suggesting one more clue to differentiate. Suppose if it is not medial longitudinal fasciculus injury, if it is due to my left eye's oculomotor palsy, then how will be my eye? It is not only medially deviated. What else will happen to my eye? Because my inferior oblique is also affected, no? So that is the reason the left eye will be deviated down and out in the primary position. Out because of the absence action and down because of superior obliques depressing action. 
in the absence of inferior oblique. So, in the primary position only the eye globe is affected, na? that's how we will recognize. Very good. But the point of interest is convergence reaction is preserved in medial longitudinal fasciculus injury, it is abnormal in oculomotor palsy. So, that is another important point I like to basically drive to you. Now, doctor, um, having had understood MLF, what is meant by supraversion? It is the upward movement, which is an elevation. So, elevation is caused by two muscles. Either superior rectus can elevate or inferior oblique can also lead to the elevation. Then infraversion is the downward movement which is also called depression which is due to the superior oblique and inferior rectus. So, these are the various movements which we need to be very sure. Infraversion, then levoversion, dextroversion, supraversion, etc., etc. Then what is meant by virgins? It is also called just like conjugate movement, you can have disjugate movement, where synchronous symmetric movement of the both eyes in opposite direction, you call it as virgins. Suppose convergence, what is the meaning of it? Both the eyes are looking medially, how are they moving? In opposite direction to each other, convergence. Then divergence. If the lateral recti are strongly acting on both the sides, then simultaneous outward movement can occur, which is then called divergence is what need to be remembered. Now, doctor, synergis, antagonist and yoke muscles, what is the meaning of them? As I told you, the most trickling topic in the entire ophthalmology is only strabismus and extraocular muscle palsy. Once you are able to, you need to take a decision. I am not going to read. This topic is one decision. By that, you are saving time at the cost of losing one mark. But if you understand, you are the only guy who understood in the entire crowd. Definitely it will be scoring. when. Tomorrow, 1 out of 10 questions is from the strabismus. Now, what are synergies? As the name itself says, the muscles having the same primary action in the same eye, in the same eye, not two different eyes. For example, if you look at uh, elevation, elevation is caused by both superior rectus and inferior oblique. Hence, both of them are basically called synergies. Then, what are antagonists? These are the muscles in the same eye having opposite action. They are like the political party, may you will have factionists. So, they are the factionists, antagonists. For example, medial and lateral recti, one is adduction, other is abduction. Superior and inferior recti, one is elevation, one is depression, and superior and inferior oblique, one is intortion and other is extortion. Then, what do you mean by yoke muscles? They are the contralateral synergies. So, it is like uh, mom and dad in the home. Only when both of them work, the home runs. If they fight, the yoke muscles, if they fight, then there will be total disharmony. So, what is a yoke muscle? Typically, a pair of muscles which contract simultaneously during the version movements are called as yoke. For example, the right lateral rectus and the left medial rectus, dono kaam kare to, we can look towards right side, lateral gaze. Hence, they both are basically called as yoke muscles. Then what are the other yoke muscles, doctor? Right medial, left lateral. Right lateral rectus, left medial rectus. Right superior rectus, left inferior oblique. Why? Right superior rectus and left inferior oblique are called as yoke muscles. 
so whenever you are looking up in a, what is a function of infinite oblique is it a intortor or extortor huh? infinite oblique is an extortor <coughs> whenever you are looking towards somebody up obliquely then one eye need to elevate and the other eye need to extort so you can just go through how these have become york muscles coolly but if examiner examiner will not ask you right medial rectus ka york muscle kaun hai bolke everybody will answer it will be a big joke in the exam examiner will ask you right superior rectus ka who is the york left inferior oblique right inferior rectus ke liye left superior oblique right superior oblique ke liye left inferior rectus and right inferior oblique ke liye left superior rectus everybody can remember the mr lr relation but the other things lot of people don't remember in the yoke muscle so that is where my job is to make you to remember okay doc now what is contralateral antagonist they are the pair of the muscles which have a opposite action in different types for example the right lateral rectus and left lateral rectus if they together act one eye will fly this side other eye will fly other side so they are the typical contralateral antagonists they are called as now doctor there are two laws which are governing the ocular movements <coughs> ocular movements uh, is the audio okay or it is only the problem for akil just check that huh? for everybody else is the audio is okay right so we are very happy to see our uh, alumni who uh, was in our final year uh, batch now coming out successfully into housemanship what is your name doctor huh vinod eh? very good vinod so <clears throat> what are the laws which are governing the ocular movements we have a herring's law of uh, equal innervation what is the meaning of it there is a equal and simultaneous innervation which flows from the brain to the pairs of the muscles which contract simultaneously typically to the yoke muscles there will be equal amount of energy which will be going why do we need this loss typically whenever we study the strabismus there is something called primary deviation where a strabismic i will be showing secondary deviation which a normal eye which is behind the cover will be showing so to understand all that uh, why primary deviation is equal to secondary or secondary is more than primary you need to know this herring's law so what is herring's law whenever we are having the ocular movements the brain will send equal amount of electrical energy to the both yoke muscles is what you need to basically remember now if you are having a dextroversion dextroversion means right side dekh rahe hain aap then the right lateral rectus and the left medial rectus both will typically receive a equal and simultaneous flow of the electrical energy in the innervation then if you are having a convergence both the eyes are looking towards a near point then the both medial rectae are there no middle rectae on left middle rectae on right they both will receive the equal innervation that is basically called as herring's law then during dextro elevation right side elevation of the eye right superior rectus and left inferior oblique they receive equal and simultaneous 
innervation. That's the reason we need to remember. Yoke muscles are what and what? And what is meant by Herring's law? Then what is Sherrington's law of reciprocal innervation? Very simple. Jab entrance ke liye prepare ho rahe hai, when you are preparing for MD entrance, just your reading is not enough. Spoiling your roommate's peace of mind is also important for getting a seat. That is called a sharing law of reciprocal innervation. So it says that during ocular motility, increased flow of innervation to a particular contracting muscle is accompanied by a decreased flow of innervation to the antagonist muscle to that particular contracting muscle. For example, if my right lateral rectus is acting, my right medial rectus is antagonistic to my right lateral rectus. So, unko chup baito bol dega. Aur left, right lateral rectus ko innervation jayega. That is basically called, within the same eye, is basically called Sherrington's law. So, the right lateral and left medial rectus ko, whenever you are looking right side, that the conjugate movement. So, both of them will require, receive equal innervation. But then, Antagonistic muscles. What is the antagonistic to the right lateral rectus? Right medial. Antagonistic to the left medial is left lateral. Those respective muscles will typically get inhibited. So that is basically called Sherrington's law. Now, what are the various diagnostic positions of the gaze which we use in the evaluation of the ocular movements? We have one primary position, four secondary and four tertiary positions. Now, what do you mean by primary position of the gaze? There is a distant object, we are focusing on watching the distant object. When you are watching at a distant object, then the position is basically called primary. Then, if you look up or if you look down, straight down, or you are looking towards your right or towards your left. These four positions are called as secondary positions. Then tertiary means what? When you combine a vertical and a horizontal movement together. For example, you say dextro elevation. So you are looking towards the right and also you are looking up. So two got combined. Dextro elevation, dextro depression, levo elevation, levo depression. So, you are almost obliquely uh, viewing the things. Then you call it as tertiary position of the gaze. Now, doctor, let us talk about paralytic strabismus. We will talk about non-paralytic strabismus as a different topic. But for today, let us talk paralytic strabismus. So, any ocular deviation which is resulting from complete or incomplete paralysis of any of the extraocular muscles is basically called as paralytic strabismus. What is the main symptom of the paralytic strabismus? Diplopia, double image, is the most important symptom. And uh, suppose, let us say, my right lateral rectus is paralyzed, doctor, due to absence palsy. So, when I am looking in my primary position, will I have diplopia? No. No. If I am looking towards my left, I will not have diplopia. But if I am looking towards my right, that is the direction where paralyzed muscle is expected to work, na, then the diplopia will be maximum. So, diplopia is most marked when the person is looking towards the side of action of the paralytic muscle is the nature of the diplopia, right? Then, in a divergent squint, typically the type of diplopia will be a cross diplopia and in a convergent squint it will be typically a uncrossed diplopia. The two images they can cross or they may not cross. 
it depends upon what type of squint it is divergent or convergent squint then even the two images which you are seeing in the diplopia may be separated vertically or obliquely also you can have the two images separated so it can be horizontal diplopia vertical diplopia oblique diplopia depending upon which muscle got paralyzed that will decide these various types of diplopia fundamentally why diplopia will result whenever you are looking towards for example your uh, right side your left eye already came to know about it and it came to the adduction position it is already seeing what is there on your right but your right eye is unable to say move towards your right side it is still seeing the image which is available straight so generally when both the eyes turn same time then the corresponding points on the retina will receive the same image but in this case what is happening the paralyzed eye is unable to move so it is receiving still the image which is there in the primary position and the other eye which is normally is already receiving the image so naturally there is a double image because of the lack of falling of the image on a similar point but falling on a dissimilar point it lead to development of diplopia obviously when we see two two fiancés two two girlfriends two two boyfriends there is a confusion which is the second important feature then definitely it will lead to nausea to see one only is nausea to see two is what i go nausea then the in the primary position itself sometimes the eye become deviated just like oculometer palsy hai to what is the primary position may situation of the eye it is laterally deviated and downward pushed why because superior oblique action will which is not which is still working superior oblique will be working if oculomotor palsy is there it will make it go down because of unopposed action in oculomotor palsy and abductor will drag it out so out and down primary position only you will find a deviated eye that is what are the features so summarized of the we have a diplopia confusion nausea vertigo and ocular deviation now what are the clinical signs in case of uh, paralytic strabismus we have a primary deviation what is the meaning of it that affected eye is there no which is paralyzed typically the muscles which are not paralyzed will keep it in a deviated position so the deviation of that affected eye is basically called as primary deviation for example doctor if my abductor right abductor is paralyzed what will be my primary deviation of the right eye it will be in a adducted position that's called primary deviation if my medial rectus if my oculomotor is paralyzed my eye is the paralyzed eye is typically is in a out and down position that is called primary deviation then what is meant by secondary deviation typically if you ask the guy who has a paralysis on one side to use his paralyzed eye and fix upon a particular point right then he is using his paralyzed his squinted eye in order to fix up to see some point whenever he is trying to do that there is typically electrical discharge released from the brain that electrical discharge will go to the opposite eye no so that electrical discharge will make the other eye to deviate that is called as secondary deviation it is the deviation of the normal eye which is under cover under cover why did you keep it under cover because it is not permitted to fix the paralyzed eye is made to fix a object and during that time the discharged electrical current will make under the cover whatever the normal eye is there that to get deviated which is then called as secondary deviation 
so this deviation in the normal eye under the cover when the paralyzed eye is trying to fixate is typically greater than the deviation of the paralyzed eye itself so secondary deviation greater than primary deviation is equal to paralytic squint samajh gaya na ha so this is most important so why does this basically happen it is the herring's law of equal innervation of the yoke muscles is basically responsible typically there is a strong impulse of innervation which is required for the paralyzed eye to fix up that object the same strong amount of electrical activity will go to the yoke muscle of the normal eye and that lead to typically development of a deviation in the normal eye so that is responsible for the secondary deviation but the secondary deviation will be it's a strong electrical impulse which went to the normal eye yoke muscle and secondary deviation will be more than the primary deviation in case of uh, uh, typically paralytic squint ye pura story mein khali ye ek line aap yaad mein rakhe to that's enough for entrance baad mein dekh lenge ms ophthalmology ke baad you will be doing fellowship in uh, um, queens college or kings college of uh, ophthalmology you know that time you can uh, super specialize for entrance sake sake you remember secondary deviation more than primary deviation in the case of the paralytic squint second thing you don't remember and oh, no no second thing second point also you should remember what is that if it is a non paralytic squint secondary deviation is equal to primary deviation not less than primary deviation okay so secondary deviation equal to primary deviation is non paralytic secondary deviation more than primary deviation is because of paralytic squint but that's more than enough then obviously when it is paralyzed what is the important critical sign there is a restriction of the movement in the direction where that particular paralyzed muscle is expected to move it can't move the restriction of movement is another important clinical sign so you find primary deviation secondary deviation if you put under the cover the normal eye cope then you will also have restriction of the ocular movement it is what you need to basically remember then the head will go into a compensatory posture what is the reason when you are seeing two two images your eye is unable to move and creating two two images you will try to compensate by shifting your head so to avoid diplopia confusion there is a compensatory head posture typically the head is compensatorily postured in the direction of the action of the paralyzed muscle for example if my right lateral rectus is paralyzed means how will be my head deviated typically my right lateral rectus is expected to turn my eye towards right side abduct my eye since i am unable to do that i make my head to move towards the right side in order to prevent the uh what you call diplopia so you can see this classically this is a case of a 2 year old girl who has a right superior oblique palsy justify this superior oblique what will it do superior intact or extract intact that means the superior pole of the globe is expected to medially rotate okay then superiors will also do what depress so that is the reason how is the head position here it is typically depressed right so the turning of the head is typically in the direction of 
the action of the paralyzed muscle that's the point of interest here then there is a false projection or a orientation which you see what is the reason of what is the reason for that typically uh, that particular paralyzed muscle there is a increased uh, innervation and that lead to development of this false projection how will you demonstrate this you ask the patient to close the sound eye and use his paralyzed eye to fixate a object then with the paralyzed eye he can fixate the object but typically the place where he identifies the image will be away from the actual position of the image that's called as false projection of the image for example if there is a right lateral rectus palsy then with that right eye where the lateral rectus is paralyzed you try to ask him to see the guy who is uh, opposite him then he will recognize the guy a little more right than what actually he is so that is basically called false projection which is another important principle of uh, uh, feature of paralytic squint now doctor what are the pathological sequelae which will result because of this extraocular muscle palsy typically a extraocular muscle palsy can be because of two reasons either a problem in the nerve or the problem in the muscle itself so if there is a problem and a paralysis due to a lesion in the nerve more than than in the muscle if it is a neuropathy rather than myopathy then the sequelae pathological sequelae will be much more now what are those sequelae typically the contralateral synergistic muscle to that of that paralyzed muscle will be overacting is a very important feature then in the same eye there is a antagonistic muscle for every other muscle for my lateral rectus my medial rectus in the right eye is a antagonistic muscle that antagonistic muscle which is a direct antagonistic muscle it will typically undergo contracture second important principle then in the contralateral antagonistic muscle for example my right lateral rectus is paralyzed then medial rectus is what antagonistic muscle to my uh lateral rectus so the contralateral antagonistic muscle will typically will show a secondary inhibitional palsy so these are all the long term sequelae of the extraocular muscle palsy now let us take one classical example if my right lateral rectus is paralyzed what is the long term consequence of that overaction of contralateral synergistic muscle so for my right lateral left to medial is the synergistic muscle which typically shows overaction then direct antagonistic muscle for my right lateral right medial is the direct antagonist it will show contracture then contralateral antagonistic muscle for my right it is the left not medial lateral rectus is a contralateral antagonistic muscle it will show inhibitional palsy rarely examiner can ask which will undergo overaction which will undergo contracture which will undergo inhibition if a particular muscle has suffered paralysis in a case of paralytic squint you must be very sure to answer so what kind of diplopia doctor convergent squint may uncrossed and divergent squint may cross diplopia is what you need to remember now let us go through the various types of ocular palsies 
you can have uh, isolated muscle paralysis generally oculomotor and only supplies most of the muscles if it is injured means all of them will suffer only lateral rectus superior oblique can suffer isolated paralysis then third cranial nerve paralysis is the uh, traditional paralytic uh, squint now doctor what are the consequences of it there is a ptosis phytosis levator palpebral superior is innervated by the oculomotor is paralyzed there is a deviation of the eye globe as proposed by vikas eyeball is turned down out and slightly impacted because of the unopposed action of the lateral rectus and superior oblique then ocular muscle movements are restricted because it is a paralytic squint then it is typically the restriction in all the direction except outward direction because that is taken care by abducens pupil is fixed and dilated why dilated because sphincter pupillae is innervated by the oculomotor nerve parasympathetic innervation then accommodation is completely lost because ciliary muscle which will contract relax and accordingly affect the suspensory ligaments of the lens and affect the curvature of the lens and affect the accommodation ability that ciliary muscle is paralyzed because that is innervated once more by the oculomotor nerve parasympathetic innervation then there is a cross diplopia which is elicited if you raise that uh, totic eyelid because because of the ptosis he can't appreciate double image first of all he can't see if you lift that then diplopia will be there that diplopia will be a cross diplopia then head posture is typically changed if the ptosis is uh, lifted up then uh, entire world looks upside down and to compensate that then the head uh, posturing will uh, typically change to compensate so that's all the story of uh, oculomotor pansy now two to three terms we need to know doctor what is total ophthalmoplegia what is external ophthalmoplegia what is internuclear ophthalmoplegia which we already discussed what is total ophthalmoplegia all extraocular muscles including the levator palpebral superioris and also intraocular muscles which include sphincter pupillae ciliary muscle all of them are paralyzed when will you get total ophthalmoplegia third now fourth now six now if all of them are jointly paralyzed it can occur if there is in two scenarios one is cavernous sinus thrombosis total ophthalmoplegia and orbital apex syndrome is another entity where total ophthalmoplegia can occur then what is external ophthalmoplegia all extraocular muscles are paralyzed but the intraocular muscles are not paralyzed so where do you have this any lesion any lesion which is involving the cranial nerves without affecting edinger westphal will typically lead to external ophthalmoplegia where all extra muscles are paralyzed without affecting uh, the uh, intraocular muscles then already we discussed no internuclear ophthalmoplegia medial longitudinal fasciculus which is connecting the fourth and sixth cranial nerve nucleus sorry third and uh, sixth cranial nerve nucleus got affected what is the common reason which systemic condition internuclear ophthalmoplegia we see doctor multiple sclerosis because of the demyelination of the medial longitudinal fasciculus we typically come across internuclear ophthalmoplegia now another important thing that we need to basically review so i am very happy today we have almost 45 online audience still we did not touch 50 so i think tomorrow day after tomorrow we will touch 50 with our kadapa center becoming up and uh, running uh, we'll have uh, starting from second year to house surgeons will be attending uh, the session 
So every year we conduct uh, a 30 weeks or a 29 week session from the month of March 1st to November 1st. So what we are saying is there are 1250 topics that is an entire MBBS. So you are in first year, second year, third year, doesn't matter. Ultimately knowing 10 to 20 points about these 1250 topics and 25,000 database is all about MBBS. So this is called distance learning. So garme byte ke bhi 25,000 points katham kar sakte. Right? So paralytic squint. How will you investigate, evaluate and discover? We can do diplopia charting is one method. You will ask the patient to wear a red and green diplopia charting glasses they are called as. And the red glass is in front of the right eye and the green is in front of the left. In a semi dark room, typically you will show one fine linear light from a distance of about 4 feet. Then uh, you will ask the person to comment on the image in the primary position and in different positions of the gaze. Then typically the patient then will be identifying the separation of the images. Diplopia will then become prominent and he will be telling in this direction I am having more diplopia, in this direction I am having less diplopia. Accordingly you will come to conclusion as to which muscle is basically paralyzed. Then we use a HES screening test. In this only for entrance exam and even for MBBS exam, this main headings if you remember more than enough, diplopia charting using the red and green diplopia charting glasses just like perimetry. Then HES screen test, HES screen test can enable you to know any pathological sequel has happened, any overaction, any contracture or if there is any secondary inhibitional palsy because of a long standing neurogenic lesion leading to the development of oculomotor, I mean uh, extraocular palsy. Then you will also discover use the field of binocular fixation and a force reduction test. These are all used in the evaluation. Now what is the purpose of this? This is important for the exam commonly asked question. How will you differentiate between that of uh, a incomitant squint due to the paralysis of the extraocular muscle and a squint which is occurring because of the mechanical restriction of the ocular movements? Can there be any mechanical restriction of the ocular movement? Somebody can have a fibrosis of his lateral, lateral rectus muscle. Duvain's retraction syndrome like conditions. In them, it is not a nerve which is paralyzed. It is a muscle which got fibrosed. So is it the fibrosis in the muscle or whether it is a paralysis, a lesion in the nerve? If you want to differentiate the two, you do force reduction test. So what will you do in this? You will ask the person to pa passively rotate. If there is any resistance to the passive rotation, then uh, it is due to the mechanical restriction. And if there is a, uh, if the force reduction test is negative, then it is basically a neural lesion, as simple as that. So how do you ultimately manage, doctor? Surgical treatment is the only option available. In this, what will you do? Generally, if there is any paralytic uh, squint, we will wait for about 6 months for a conservative management and recovery. If it doesn't, then you need to do surgery. What will you do in surgery? Simple. If something is paralyzed, make its antagonist also to paralyzed. If you don't get food, don't let anybody else eat food. That is the principle of strabismic surgery, which is done only, what is the buzzword? 6 months, if there is no recovery. So there is all the story about uh, paralytic squint. So doctor, 